a day when God has become generic. You can ask somebody, do you believe in God? But you got to get a little bit more specific. You got to say, do you believe in God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Do you believe in God? You know God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Do you believe in God, the one that gave his only begotten Son to save the world? Because nowadays you don't know what God they're talking about. But it says here, if you believe in God, as the scripture has said, then out of your belly. Now here, belly comes from the word kolos, which means hollow. And it also denotes the womb. It means your most inner part. It means that part in you where you have a spiritual destiny. See, it's in that spiritual womb that you have your calling, you have your gifts, you have your potential, you have your purpose. And see, that's why we have to guard it with our very life. Because it's precious, that which is on the inside of us. See, when you begin to guard it, you ain't going to let anybody speak over it. You're not going to watch anything that could contaminate that that spiritual womb. You're not going to just listen to anything. See, I get scared of people who be church hopping. I get scared of people who just running after a word all the time. I get scared of that because if my womb is precious, I'm not going to let it get contaminated by just anybody. So that spiritual womb that has your giftings and your callings, the Bible says out of it shall flow rivers of living water. See, that living water talks about gushing forth. It talks about bubbling. It talks about power. It talks about strength. It's refreshing. It's satisfying. So because of my gifts and my callings on the inside of me, I should have a level of power and strength and anointing. But what happens is, oftentimes we get sidetracked. And see, we forget that we have the kingdom of God on the inside of us. And because we have so much life in that living water that's on the inside of us, when we walk into a room, the atmosphere should change. When we walk into the room, darkness should be dispelled. Because the Bible says that we ought to have life and we ought to have it more abundantly. So when we come into the room, if there's gossip, if there's tension, if there's all kinds of mess, when we walk into the room, it should cease. That's the type of living water Jesus is talking about. And it says there's rivers of living water. And when you think about river, you, if you had an aerial view of a river, you would see that it has a path. It has a specific path. And it has a specific destination. So what the Bible is saying that out of my spiritual womb, I should be able to propel my gift through the living water that's powerful and anointed. And it push me through the river which symbolizes the grace of God. So because the grace of God is carrying me through, it takes me to places that I couldn't go on my own. It enables me to do stuff that I couldn't do in my own strength. It helps me to make it when they were falling and sinning and messing up because the grace of God covered my life. I was able to stand and stand strong. All oh, but the grace of God. And so as we are going with this and we're going through the river of life and things are going well, just because the grace of God is on your life doesn't mean you're not going to encounter some obstacles. So right when you think everything is going okay, I got my gifts coming, I'm flowing in an area that I've never flown in, and I feel like I'm doing all right, all of a sudden, right in the middle of your river is a big obstacle that has begun to block your flow. What do you do? What happens? There are two things that could take place in your life. When you are faced with a mountain before you, there are two negative things that could happen. 
it can cause you to become stagnant. Because when there is a blockage and it's dammed up the river, all of a sudden that which was flowing, that which had a current, now it stopped and becomes a pool that is stagnant. And there's no life. And what happens when that takes place, this is what you've said in your heart. You said, forget it. It's too hard. It's too big. It's not worth that pain. It's not worth it. I, I, can't, I can't see myself making it through that. My son, he got off of drugs and now he's back on drugs again. Forget it. I can't go through this roller coaster again. Why is it that I can't get a job? I have a degree. I am qualified. What's wrong with me? Forget it. I just give up. The devil is a liar. And that's just what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to get stagnant so much that you die. So much that you have no more power left in you. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Then in, in Galatians chapter 5 verse 7, Paul says it again. You did one well. Who did hinder you that you would not obey the truth? Why was that block in your flow so powerful that it stopped you? That it made you focus on the facts instead of believing in the truth? Why did you let it stop you? Because if you only believe the word as the scripture said, if you only continue to be consistent and diligent in my word, don't you know I can move that thing? Because all you got to do is speak to it and it must be cast down. All you got to do is command it to get out of your way and it must go. All you have to do is flee from the enemy and he must flee. Why did you believe the lie? Why were you bamboozled? Why were you tricked? Why were you foolish? And the Bible says he, they, they were bewitched. That means the enemy has a way of putting a spell on you to make you think something that's not true. Fear. False evidence appearing real. Fear. False evidence appearing real. Fear. If the devil can get you in fear to quit, he's got you. But we're not going to operate in fear. But we're going to operate in power and love and in a sound mind. So when we begin to say, okay, I'm not going to focus on the facts, but I'm going to focus on the truth. Number two, when you are faced with a blockage in your flow, what will begin to happen is you begin to divert from the path that you're supposed to go on. Because when the blockage is here, you're supposed to be going straight and narrow. But because the blockage is there, you tend to veer off and go a different direction. Turn with me to Luke. Chapter 2, verse 41. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. And I'm not going to read, and, and I want you to go to 41 through 49, but we're not going to read the whole thing. Here we see that Jesus is 12 years old, and his parents, Mary and Joseph, are going to Jerusalem like they did every year for the feast of the Passover. And they go and they do what they always do because the Bible says they go every single year. And so they're just going about their business, doing what they got to do. And then they decide it's time to go, so they leave. And the Bible says that after a day's journey, they realize something. Jesus wasn't with them. Where is Jesus? And the Bible says it took them three days to go back to find him. And he was in the temple 
doing his father's business, talking to the scribes, talking to the, the doctors, and they were being able to ask him questions, and he was answering the questions. And Mary's like, boy, why, why, why weren't you with us? And he's like, I have to do my father's business. And see, sometimes as church folk, we can get used to doing the same thing the same way all the time. And when we look up, God ain't even with us. The presence of God isn't even there. Because we know how to say the hallelujahs, thank you, Jesus. We know how to shout the white shout. We understand how to do the, 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 the lethargic things that, that is so easy to do because we grew up in it. We know how to do it. But could it be Jesus ain't even in it? And see, what's interesting about this text, they lost him in one day, but it took three days to get him back. See, it's easier to lose the anointing than to get it back. It's easy to step out of the flow than to step back into the flow. And see, we never want to get in that predicament where we're doing our own thing, going in our own flow, and God ain't even in it. You see, that's why we have to be diligent to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because if we're not careful, that block in our way will cause us to go in our own agenda, on our own accord, in our own plan. And all the while, we're going the wrong direction and don't even know it. A form of godliness denying the power thereof. What do I do to stop the blockage? You got to press. Now this is interesting. Because you got to press. First you got to be pressed. And I'm going to teach it a little bit. And then you got to press. And see what we have to understand is this. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26 verse 36. That Jesus was now going to Gethsemane. And he was at a time in his life where he was about to go upon the cross. And it was a hard thing. All this other time he was really flowing through and he was going. But now he's got a little block, a big block in the road. And it's called the cross. And he's saying, what do I need to do, Father? You know, if you could just take this thing away, take it away. But it's your will, Lord God. I got to pray. And the, go, let's, go, let's go to that scripture so we can get it. Matthew 26, verse 36. Have you ever been up at night? Can't sleep? Your pillow's wet from crying? Have you ever been so consumed with debt that you can't eat because you're thinking about the bills? It's like you're being choked out, wondering how you're going to buy the baby's milk. Wondering how you're going to get them kids them shoes because their feet keep growing every month. Wondering how you're going to work on their college education that you know that you have to do, but it just seems like there's no way out. This is where Jesus was. And the Bible says that he was so overwhelmed, and it's in verse 38, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry and watch with me. Now, Gethsemane means the place of oil press. And what we have to understand is this. Olive oil symbolizes the anointing. And the only way to get the oil out of the olive is to what? Press it. And the Bible speaks of Gethsemane is the oil press. Isn't it amazing how Jesus was right there? And see, what was going through Jesus right now was getting him to the next level because he was in a place of real prayer. He was in a place of transparency before God. And sometimes when we have a blockage in our way, we have to be in a place that we're willing to be pressed by God. We're willing to humble ourselves and say, God, this is not what I want, but if it's your will, then I'm willing to endure it because I want to go to the next level in you. And I want this block out of my way. I want to flow in your anointing. I want to flow in your grace. I want to do the assignment that you have for me to do. But I got to be pressed. And the oil press deals with stones that crush and bruise and hurt. And some of y'all have been in that place. 
oppressing. You done prayed, you done fasted, you done tithed, you done did everything that you're supposed to do. Good. The anointing is growing in your life. Good. He's taking you to the next level. He's seeing if he can trust you. He wants to use you to go against the enemy. He wants you to be able to crush the enemy's head. He wants to use you, but can he trust you? And he finds that out through the pressing. Now, once you understand, okay, God, just have your way. I'm stop fighting. I'm not going to fight no more. I'm not going to question if you still God. I'm not going to question, are you hearing my prayers? I understand what I'm going through. Then you get to a place where you have to press. See, really, when you being pressed, that gives you to strength. You might not feel it, but you're actually being put on demand because God is stripping your spiritual muscles so that you can press against the enemy. And the only way to get that is to go through the press. So turn with me to Judges chapter 16, verse 16. Because now we have to press. Here's Samson and Delilah. And we see that the Bible says in Judges 16, verse 16, And it came to pass, when Delilah pressed him daily with her words, and urged him so, that his soul was vexed unto death. Ladies, I want to tell y'all something. We have the natural ability to press. You know, if, if the door isn't fixed and you want him to fix that screen, he go to bed here and you, did you fix that screen? He, while he's eating the dinner, did you fix the screen? While, he, while he's going out to work, did you fix that screen? Uh, he gets a call at work and he, you hear a message on his answer machine. Honey, have you seen, did you fix the screen yet? See, they call it nagging, but I call it pressing. Come on. See, we got that natural ability to press. Just as the Syrophoenician woman, when she wanted to get her daughter delivered, and she walked up to where Jesus was, and she, Jesus said no. Jesus called her a daughter, and she was like, that's all right, but can you deal with my daughter? <laughs> See, we got a natural ability to press. We just got to use it. She says the woman with the issue of blood. She was able to press through the cross. She didn't care who was looking. She didn't care. She was going to get her deliverance. And she pressed as the woman who went to the unrighteous judge. And she said, I want you to avenge my enemies. And he wouldn't listen. But she was there in the morning. She was there in the afternoon. She was there at night. And finally he said, because you worry me, I will do it. Can you worry God? Can you get up in God's face and say, God, you said I would be healed. God, you said I would be delivered. God, don't you remember in your word what you said? God, you said it. You said it, God. You said it. You don't give up. You pray until something happens. Hannah, she was in a place where she wanted a baby. The Bible says she would go up to the temple and pray and pray and pray and pray. And the priest thought she was drunk. But she had her mind set. And her husband Elkanah came up to her and said, Honey, I'm I worth ten sons. And he, she was like, Thank you very much, but you, you're good to me and I thank you for that. But I want a baby. And sometimes we got to get to the place where we're not going to settle for nothing less than what we know God said for us. And the enemy will come and try to give you something counterfeit. Come on, single ladies. You know what God said. You know what he's supposed to be like. He's supposed to be saved. He's supposed to be anointed. He's supposed to be sanctified. He's supposed to be the priest of his home. Why are you looking at this jigaboo over here? Why are you looking at this ungodly man over here? You don't settle for nothing but the best. So you have to keep a clear focus on what God said was for you. 
The Bible says that an un, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And when you start diverting and you start getting in other areas, then you start losing what God told you. And you start losing the focus that God has given to you. That's why Paul said, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. See, this is not going to trip me up. That's not going to trip me up because I'm pressing forward. I'm looking at that finish line. What is your dream? What is your calling? What is it that God put in your womb? Can I tell you it's never too late? Maybe you messed up. Maybe you stepped off course. But can I say, even if it takes you three days to get back in the flow, you do whatever it takes to get back in the flow. If that means you gotta pray, and you gotta fast, and you gotta push, and you gotta give up and kick him out of your house, and you, I'm not talking about your husband now, I'm talking about somebody that's shacking, you gotta kick him out, you gotta cut off friends, whatever it takes for you to get back in the flow, get back in the flow. It's not too late. But will you stay focused? Will you keep your eye focused? Will you not become double-minded? And what's so good about this, when you're focused, and if somebody comes and say anything contrary to the word of God, all of a sudden these red lights start flashing. Hmm, that ain't what God said. Oh no, that's not what God told me. Wait a minute, that's all. Why? You never fell wind to every doctrine. You never fell wind to every word. You stay focused. And that's when God will show up, when you're focused. So now we understand that we have to press. And we understand that we have to push when the obstacles get in our way. And see, the good thing about this is that you can understand, man, when, I first, when I, that thing happened, that first blocked my flow. It was so hard. I mean, I couldn't believe how bad it was. It was hard. But then, when it happens again, it ain't as hard. And then when it happens again, you say, oh, oh, that thing. Because you begin to grow in the spirit. See, the more you press, the more muscles you get. The more you push, the more spiritual authority you have. See, the more you enter into the flow of the spirit, the more domination of the enemy you have. And see, when you see another sister stop, stuck at a place where there's a flow blockage, and you can recognize it because you were there, you can sense it and sniff it out because that used to be you, then you can come into agreement with your sister because your faith now is strong enough, your anointing now is strong enough, your authority in the spirit now is strong enough, and you can grab hold of your sister and say, let's press together, let's push together. You're not going to be here long because I've been through this and I'm telling you by my testimony, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. We don't go through stuff for ourselves. We go through things because God wants us to help somebody else. So now we understand, hey, my God, you mean to tell me I'm able to let the flow go and if a blockage comes, it ain't going to stop me? Yes. But I have some news for you. There is one thing that could stop your flow. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Something happens when you begin to press. When you allow God to press you and allow the anointing to grow strong in your life, something begins to happen. You begin to flow at another level. So you were flowing before. And then when you got stuck, see many times when we flow and we get stuck, then instead of God's grace taking us, we try to go in our own strength. And we pull out the oars and we start trying to do the boat ourselves, but it ain't the same. 
But when you learn how to press, then all of a sudden that where you would maybe take you two weeks to get done takes you two days. That which took somebody else five years to build, you build it in two years. See, you begin to move at a quicker pace because God is taking you and accelerating you on another level and another type of flow because you're going higher and you're going faster. And the first thing that happens when you begin to enter into that place of flow, you lose all self-consciousness. Now, this is a place like, you could, let's say this, you could be the most conservative woman. You never wear bathing suits, you never show your arms, you never show your legs, you don't do anything. But when you get up in that hospital room with your legs up in the stirrups about to push out an eight pound baby, your legs gapped open, you can have ten men in there. But you, you have a loss of self-consciousness. You don't care because your focus on pushing that thing out. spiritual womb. You get to a place where I don't care anymore. If I gotta go down to that altar, I'm coming down to that altar. I don't care if I've been saved 10 years, 15 years. If I gotta get with God, I'm coming there. I don't care if I gotta be at work and I'm opening up my Bible because God is speaking a word to me. I don't care. I begin to die to myself. I begin to die to my flesh and I begin to operate more in the spirit because I don't care about me anymore. I care about my purpose. I care about my giftings and my call. I care about my destiny. So you begin to die to yourself as you enter into that flow. You lose self-consciousness. Somebody say something and bless you. You have no problem. Praise the Lord. Jesus is good. And you don't care who hears you. You stop being an undercover Christian. So now we're entering into that flow. And then number two, there becomes a transformation of time. See, when you start moving to that flow, have you ever been reading a good book and you look up and three hours pass? You're like, man, how did that happen? Because you were in a flow. Or writing a song or doing something musically because you're in that flow it begins time and see some people say you still you still in that church you still believe in God for that house you still believe in God for that and also you like man I didn't even realize that time has gone by because I'm in the flow God is doing something in me God is preparing me God is moving me and time begins to stand still when you're in the flow. And this part I love the most. It becomes autotelic. Now autotelic means you do it just because you like doing it. You don't do it for the money. You don't do it for any benefit necessarily. You do it because you like doing it. It's like Jordan. When Jordan retired, he came back because he he liked doing it. He didn't need the money. And see, God wants us to get to a place where we get to worship him and loving him, not because we want anything from it. No, because he woke me up this morning. Because he kept me in my right mind. Because he loved me when nobody else loved me. Because he pushed me and kept me and held me when I was going crazy. I love to love on God, not because of what he can give me, but what he's already done. If he have, does not do another thing for me, I want to worship him. I want to praise him. I want to love him. I want to bow my knees to him. I want to lay prostrate before him because I love him. And that's where God wants to get you to. And you know, God is just good like that. When you love him like that, he start throwing stuff at you. He start giving you this. He start blessing you. He start giving you abundance. He starts giving you more. Because he's just good like that. But can you have a mindset that, God, I'm going to love you just because of who you are. You talking about a real flow now. I'm going to love you just because you're good. 
I'm going to stay in your presence because I like feeling the fullness of joy that's in your presence. See, I ain't asking nothing from you, God. I just want to be where you are. See, I understand that I can't even breathe without you. I can't live without you. I can't move without you. I'm in love with you, God. When you get to that place, we're talking about a real flow now. And God says, I can trust this one. I can trust that daughter. I can trust her. I can trust her because she ain't in it for her name. She's not in it for a position. She's not in it for a title. She's not in it for popularity. She's not in it for, for her to get her name in life. She's in it for me, saith the Lord. We get to that place. God says, yes. I can trust her. So we see we can begin to flow in God, but there's still that one thing that we have to talk about. Turn with me. You got Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from where? The heart. And they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts. You mean all that could be in somebody's heart and they not do it yet, but it's in their heart? See, we started out this session about guarding your heart. Diligently. Keeping it pure. But when you let your guards down, then that spiritual gift that you have God gave you to sing, to worship, to bring deliverance. But then you start doing it to shake your thing and dropping it like it's hot. You start using that which God gave you for the anointing to bring deliverance. You start using it for the world to bring glory to the devil. But a season is only but a season. You start letting the world infiltrate that, that holy place and contaminate it. You used to be full of joy. You used to be nice. You, but all of a sudden, you got bitterness. You got resentfulness, jealousy, envy. Why? Because you didn't guard it. Soon as it starts to creep in and you recognize it, you got to deal with it. And see, we have a lot of people that sit up in church with a smile on their face. But inside, it's like cold. Because they will understand, why, hasn't, why haven't I made it yet? Why isn't my flow like her flow? Why isn't my flow like that flow? It's because you got some contaminants in your spiritual room. And God can't work with that. And because you allow that to happen, the only thing that can block your flow is you. The only thing that can block you from getting to your destination, from getting to your path, is you. Is it not a trip? You mean all this time I've wasted was because of me? For the word of God, now if you believe the word, or believe Jesus as the word has said, then you can understand that nothing is impossible to him that believes. So even though my situation looks impossible, because I believe the word, I understand that it might look impossible to man, but to God it's possible. And 